Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Motivating Your Team with Empathy and Story. I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's program is sponsored by Skillsoft. This event will be recorded, and the recording and slides will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event and via the handouts module in the GoToWebinar control panel. We welcome your questions. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the control panel. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If you encounter audio or other difficulties during today's program, please follow the instructions in the questions module. Our speaker today is Nancy Duarte. Nancy is the CEO of the communications firm Duarte Inc., and the author of six best selling books, including Data Story Explain Data and Inspire Action Through Story. Nancy, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm excited to be here today to talk about how you can motivate your teams through empathy and story. And a lot of people wonder why story. And story is one of the most powerful communication devices known to man. And now that we can hook up fMRI machines to the human brain, we can see what's going on when a story is being told. So one of the things that happens is it engages all the sensing parts of the brain, which means we're feeling what's being said. Also, it brings us together because when I'm telling a story and you're listening to that story, our brains are ticking in the exact same order, so we're experiencing the exact same thing. Also, stories transport us. They found that the analytical and critical nature of our brain is suspended, which means our minds are open to other possibilities and probabilities. And also, stories move us to act. When a story was told um, before asking for a donation for a charity, the heightened sense of cortisol in the system it's also called the love hormone, uh, made those more generous in their donations that had heard a story beforehand. So story is the most powerful communication device because of how it's used and how story can be used in business makes it a powerful way for you to run your organization too. So I'm gonna talk about uh, four things, um, four ways to use story. Um, one of them is use it when you're communicating your vision to create desire also with your values, you tell stories around that and it'll ground your teams, especially in times of crisis. Story will also motivate action and then stories, symbols, stories surrounding symbols will conjure meaning. So I wanna go through these today and explain how they all work. So vision is very important to have because it creates desire and longing. If you have a strong vision in your organization, your employees will hop out of bed and choose to walk into your organization instead of all the other ones out there they could choose to go to. And then the role of the leader is to be constantly uh, right at the edge of today and tomorrow, constantly looking into the future to decide, oh, we need to invent a new market, we need to invent a new product, we need to raise our revenue, whatever it is that you need to do, you are the one that defines and creates the future. And then it's your role as a communicator to not only see where you need to go, but also communicate to your teams and how to get there. And so this graphic here is probably very common to you. It's the S-curve of innovation. Because organizations start, they grow, they mature, and then they go into a state of decay and decline or even death, unless there's this new infusion of the future and a new infusion of the future. And that's actually constant. Because what the, what the leader is doing is at the top of one um, S-curve of reinvention, you're already looking for the next vista to decide what could be, where does my organization need to go in the future? In fact, my own organization has been through eight reinventions in its 32 years, so this is very familiar to me. Uh, so Patty Sanchez and I, my co-author in Illuminate, we thought, gosh, does this S-curve also follow a story plot? And of course, uh, it does. So this is the shape that a great, um, that a, a transformation follows. And there's moments that you need to communicate, many, many, many moments to create desire toward the vision, toward this amazing future. This could be email, it could be via video, it can be blog posts. But you have to keep communicating as you're transforming, but there's these special moments where you need to plan and design them, where story's gonna make or break, whether or not your travelers who are, who are going along on this initiative with you, whether they'll have the right emotional fuel along the way. So if I were to break this into uh, five sections, it actually follows a three-act structure just like a story does. 
So in the dream phase, the leader casts the vision. This is when they say, this is the dream. And then right away, your travelers either jump in or maybe you have to work hard to get people to adopt your vision. Um, but the goal here is to get them to jump in. But the middle is the messy middle. This is where, uh, like if they don't jump in, that would be horrible. But they also sometimes don't jump in because they know the messy middle is gonna be hard. They know it's gonna be a fight. And then they know there's gonna be this long slog of climbing until ultimately they arrive. And then after all of that, you wind up having to do it over and over again as organizations are constantly in a state of reinvention. So what you have to do is provide the right kind of emotional fuel at every single step of the way. So in the dream phase, that's the moment of inspiration so that they can see what you see and that they want to go there with you. In the leap stage, people need a moment of decision so they can count the cost of the choices that they're facing and muster the resolve to, drop, to dive in anyway. So in the fight phase, people are going to need to be brave so they can feel courageous and capable to defeat the dragons and any roadblocks thrown their way. And in the climb stage, they need to endure. So they need to find extra motivation to keep the slog up that long hill to get to the top. And when you arrive, ultimately, People need a moment of reflection so they can celebrate their wins, mourn their losses, and recharge their batteries before the next big, big adventure. This way of communicating gives people the emotional fuel that they need to move on. In this crisis, um, my own firm has needed that. Um, believe it or not, we spend every Martin Luther King day and a half for about a decade where I cast the vision. This is the day we set aside specifically for, here's the vision for this whole year. Now we, instead of celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday, we give everyone their own birthday off to celebrate Dr. King. And then we gather, I cast a vision, and then we spend the whole day getting people to try to leap, to try to commit to the vision through activities, through applying it. We even have a glee club that sings about it. Um, so we do everything we can for that dream and leap phase. And so this January was particularly amazing because everyone jumped, they leaped, they were very excited because we came up with this vision to globally transform millions by helping them communicate best. Now we'd had this vision for a few years, but I finally sat and did the math. And I was like, wait, 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 if we're supposed to transform millions, that means our company is only about a fifth the size it needs to be, the size it needs to be to get to this vision. So everyone's fired up, we're running around. It was just the most remarkable, um, we call it shop day. It was the most remarkable shop day we had ever had. And then we get hit by this, <laughs> this meteoric blast of COVID. And you know what? We're still gonna go there. We're still gonna try to make our organization almost five times larger in five years, which means I have to I have to refer back to my own body of work um, called Illuminate to keep everyone inspired and make sure I too was providing the right kind of emotional fuel because I just got everyone to commit and jump into the fray to the messy middle. And then this like this complete pressure went on top of them. So they needed to be extra extra brave and extra, extra committed. So one of the things I did as a communicator is I pulled on story an enormous amount. I started to do video demos or video memos. They're numbered video COVID memos. And I did that because I really needed everyone to see my face. I needed them to see this is hard. This is hard for me. This is hard for all of us, but we're gonna be brave. So you can see through all the different expressions, I'm pretty expressive that it was very important people saw my face so they could see how I was dealing with the crisis and give them the emotional fuel they needed to get through it. In the season of crisis, particularly, your values ground us. In fact, our values aren't formed in the good times. It's like, oh my gosh, the company just gave us free food. Yay, that's a value for us. Your values are formed and tested in a season of crisis. So our uh, core values uh, follow a bliss model that's belong, lead, innovate, and serve. The interesting thing is that we also have bliss actions, which becomes our operating model, and they all dovetail on purpose. Fascinatingly, for about 18 months, we had been, uh, 18 months before, almost two years before, actually, we had done a very um, purposeful initiative to get everyone to not only understand the values, but to, but to be able to recite them. And the other thing is, they had to model the action. So sadly, for the last two years, we had actually been letting people go that didn't follow the values of the firm. 
fascinatingly, here comes March with the virus, and we have relied so heavily on these values. It is not, it, it's just even hard to describe how completely important it is. Now, the values have been tested too, because that's what happens. And part of us um, moving into uh, one of our values, which is to drive the industry, this particular one, I have a story about how that one was tested. Because when you look at where drive the industry dovetails, it dovetails around innovate and lead, but it also has a smart, a smaller uh, dovetail around serve and belong. So how do we react in a crisis? How do we drive the industry through innovation and leading, but also serve and create a sense of belonging to many, many people who had no sense of belonging due to the crisis? So what we did is we gave away a course. We gave away one of my most valuable courses and over a thousand people took this course for free. It tested our values because my team was a bit like, whoa, whoa, wait, look at the bottom value there. It's thrive financially. And if you look at what the dovetails there, it's lead and it's belong. So when I pointed back to the values, because that was 400 grand for a small business, that's 400 freaking grand we sure could have used, right? But you know what? It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do because one of the things that's very important to my firm is we believe that relationships and human flourishing are the currency of life. So to thrive financially, if we're not also providing human flourishing, then we failed either way. So we gave it away and everybody was delighted and rejoiced at the figures of all the money that we didn't actually bring in. Um, next, I want to talk about how story motivates action, and uh, I want to just go to a model, typical three-act structure here for you. Um, act one is there's this likable hero. Act two is they encounter roadblocks, and act three is because of that messy middle, they've emerged transformed. Story is all about transformation. It's all about transformation. So using stories and seasons when you're trying to transform your organization, you're using it in seasons where you need them to change. You could use it in a coaching situation. It's a very powerful device. And the thing that makes it powerful is that messy middle. Leaders need to talk about life is hard and here's how I overcame it. It's like, I'm this likable leader, but you know what? Life has been hard and I dealt with it like this. And therefore the end is I'm different because I learned all these lessons. There's a lot of people that don't have the bravery to talk about stories openly like that because of the messy middle. So here's an example of a classic story of Pinocchio. So a toy maker creates a wooden puppet and wishes on a star that he would be a real live boy. The puppet comes to life, but is wooden and must prove that he's worthy of being real. He joins a traveling show, tells lies, is tempted at Pleasure Island. His father was swallowed by a whale while looking for his wayward son. But the puppet saves his father, but dies himself. And because of his sacrifice, he's worthy to be a real boy. This is a classic three-act structure. That middle is so messy that he had to actually give up his life to learn the moral lesson. And so in the middle, you'll see at the bottom, the lesson of this story is to be honest, to be brave, and be unselfish. When you're telling a story, you need to start with the lesson. When you're trying to communicate transformation, you need to think about what is the lesson? What's a story I can tell that has the right lesson so people understand what they need to do right now? What is the story I can tell to my direct report? A lesson that I've learned from my messy life that'll help them get over this situation they're in. What's a, what's a story I can tell a customer? about how they too will be transformed if they try our product. All of those things are ways that you use story. And we use story in this season also, and it was incredibly important, but I first had to empathetically think about what was the right thing to do. This is a model that's completely the uh, manifestation of the Duarte method and our IP, where you have a communication strategy, you have story, which is critical, visuals that'll amplify your message, whether that's verbal or, or visual, and a delivery that compels action. This model, you'll see all dovetails with empathy every single time you communicate under any medium at all. You have to empathetically take a walk in the shoes of who you're talking to. You have to take a moment and think about their life. Think about what you're going to say. Think about what they're going to process. Think about the best way to communicate in a way that will appease their fears, give them hope, and make them want to go where you're asking them to go in the future as a leader. So what happened is the day they announced shelter in place, I had fortunately already asked my team to move 
um, home the night before. That very following Monday, we had a staff meeting. And so my husband and I took up half of the staff meeting and for 30 minutes, we told stories. This is not my first rodeo. We've been in business 32 years. This is my fifth economic hit, an external economic hit, not by anything I did, um, but by external things. So we told five stories that shaped our values and five stories of resilience. So people would know, hey, we've, we've got this, we've, we've um, ridden this pony before. What happened is I think my shop had the most glorious week, one of the most glorious weeks of its life. And we had already kind of felt like we needed to move all of our workshops to virtual. So we'd had dab we were dabbling just weeks before we had this plan. And within a year, we were gonna turn all of our workshops to virtual. So we had, uh, we had this big old um, map. We were starting to do maybe some research and we were just fiddly, fiddle faddling with it at that point in time. And the um, my facilitators are just world-class. So they have to be excellent presenters themselves. So we're working out how do we have technology? You can see in the back and the left there, there's baffling. So there's noise dampening. And we were just trying to go big and take a long time to do it. Sure enough, when COVID hit, my team, we told those stories on a Monday. And I think if we showed up scared or hadn't communicated that way, we would have had a different outcome. This team flipped everything in one week. They took a plan that was a year long and flipped everything in a week. They deconstructed a ton of courses and completely rebuilt them for a different medium in a week. They're staying up till 2 a.m. They're killing it. It was, I've just never seen anything like it. And I think the outcome would have been different if we'd started the week with it coming with a with a different staff meeting altogether. And I, I just was so proud of the team. And it is really because, oh, and here's a, a picture of the same guy with his setup at home. So you could see he <laughs> carried it all the way through. So we showed up as excellent delivering the workshops from home. In fact, our, our virtual workshops, we, we get massively high scores, but our virtual workshops, believe it or not, are getting slightly higher stores, scores than our in-person ones, which was really fun to see. And it's really because of that messy middle that we're changed. It's because of that we get to, uh, we got to tell stories of resilience and therefore my firm was resilient and it was just um, it's one of the most beautiful moments of this whole thing except of course this one uh, symbols become charged with meaning you might be able to look around where you're at right now and see little tokens or items or things around you and some of them mean nothing to you but you might look at something like your wedding ring or or something like a picture and it's just completely charged with meaning and, and, and emotional power that it wouldn't evoke in anyone else and that's kind of the power of symbols and what they do for us and my own organization has a symbol that's been around with us for a while and it was uh, founded by one of my designers and she wanted to be able to honor different people in the organization and say thank you I appreciate you so she went to cost plus and got this token this tiki thing that was uh, relatively frightening but it's supposed to scare things away but the first time it was given to one of the guys he's just I came in my office by 10 a.m. shaking and he's like this thing kind of scares me because I know it's not supposed to but I don't have the heart to tell her I'm scared and I can't get my work done so I was like look Kristen can you just run back to cost plus and get anything just get any other thing and let's start passing that instead so she went and picked up a little wooden giraffe that sits on the edge of a desk in fact this is a picture of our original giraffe but because we're such a creative business, we've already painted it and <laughs> slaughtered it and modified it. But this was the very first giraffe. This was about 15 years ago. And then, and then it started to take on meaning as we start to pass the draft, pass the draft. Everyone can buy drafts, they can expense drafts. We start to pass the drafts, then we start to wire the meaning into our culture because a draft's heart is massive. It measures two feet long and can weigh more than 25 pounds. And we would say dwarfians have really huge hearts. And then it starts to take on a life of its own, right? We have them appearing everywhere, they do cameos. And then we change the name of this celebration of past the draft, called it giraffe formations. And then when we were going through a particularly hard season about five years ago, I looked up, what is a herd of giraffes called? Like, what is it called when giraffes rally and gather to do something great? And they're called a tower. And I loved that giraffes are called a tower because it means it's such a symbol of strength, right? And it's such a symbol of refuge. And it just became wired in our culture to the point now where it's our 
sanctioned mascot. It's official. We have t-shirts and you would not believe how many giraffes we have because they're past and past and past. It just doesn't stop. I love, I love the picture with the action heroes here. It's fantastic. So when my VP of operations called the San Diego Zoo, sorry, I don't want to get emotional, and asked if we could see and have, ask a Q&A about their giraffes and they complied. It was such a great moment because the faces, everyone was like, oh my God, like nobody else on the planet probably would be this excited about having a giraffe and a moment with a giraffe. But during this crisis, another symbol has, um, another symbol has been kind of um, born into our consciousness. When I did my January keynote when uh, for shop day and the vision was so profound, I knew they had to be brave. And besides, that's the messy middle of the story, right? I, that you need to be brave in the, right in the middle of a messy middle. And in that presentation in January, I reminded everybody about a quote that's on our reception desk. It says, promise me you'll always remember you're braver than you believe and stronger than you seem and smarter than you think. This is what Christopher Robbins said to Winnie the Pooh. So this was right there in the middle of our presentation. In fact, I had slides talking about how brave we're going to have to be to get to the moon and change and transform millions of communicators. And then COVID hit <laughs> and none of us were expecting that. And so um, we tell stories a lot in our culture, like a lot, a lot, a lot. And one of my employees is the mom of a Down syndrome kiddo who is just amazing. And every year she has Joyful Day and that's on a 323. And that's because they, uh, Down syndrome kids have 23 chromosomes. And um, she gives this presentation and she tells a story every year. And so she said, mom, I don't know what story to tell. And she says, well, why don't you tell a story about the lesson that Drew taught you this year? And she said, well, he taught me to be brave. So she tells this whole story about how he taught her to be brave. And at the end, she teaches us all the ASL signal sign for being brave. And you kind of tap, tap your shoulder, tap your two shoulders, and you put your fists out, similar to what she's doing. Now, it was so powerful, like there was not a dry eye. And she had us all do that symbol several times because we all needed to be brave. And so I wanna show you again, the scene I showed you in my face in this uh, slide that I showed you earlier. And you'll see I'm actually doing that symbol when I address my team and they know that I'm asking them while I'm talking, I'm asking them to be brave. So those are ways I've chosen to solve the communication issues in my own firm by really making it clear and making sure my vision creates desire, that our values still ground us, that all the stories we tell are motivating actions, and that our symbol conjures such incredible meaning. It's actually one of the things that's sustaining us. So I just want to remind you, stories change you. They are changing you. Like there's some messy middle all of us are going through right now and we are gonna emerge changed. We're gonna emerge braver. We're gonna emerge stronger. We're gonna emerge different. And we need to talk about that. We need to talk about the transformative power in our lives that hardships bring us. Because you know what, if you're willing to talk about story, that means you're willing to change the world because the stories we tell are what is going to make the world a better place. And I wanna end with this quote and it says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. I love this quote because that's what the power of story does. It creates longing. It creates a longing to go into the future any direction you can, just like the sea, the whole future is in front of you. So I want to thank you. We set up a little URL for you guys at dorte.com slash Nancy. And there's a bunch of free stuff up there you could get from webinars to eBooks and all kinds of stuff. I just want to thank the team at MIT for having me. Um, and I'm super excited to um, chat with Paul. Well, Nancy, thank you very much. I'm just pulling up my camera now and I'll give you a second. Um, to do the same. Hey there, that was great. That was a really terrific and inspiring presentation. Um, and we've got lots of questions um, oh, yeah. from our audience and a reminder to everyone that you can submit your questions by entering them anytime in the questions module. 
we will get to as many as we possibly can. But let's start, let, let's stay on your story. I really love how you personalized this, right? Made it personal for us by talking about your own experience and how you're applying the techniques yourself. When have you felt the most tested? Was there a crucible moment in the last four to five months? Um, does anything stand out in particular? Yeah, you know, everyone's had to make really, really hard decisions um, in this season, including myself. So I think one of the biggest tests was uh, my resolve to still kind of get to the moon is what we call it, right? We're going to go to the moon and we're going to try to um, quintuple our business in five years. And so in meetings, people are like, well, now we have to add a year to our five years. I'm like, no, like can't, I had to muster the resolve to be like, Houston, we have a problem, you know, so it's just kind of Apollo 13 like for lack of a better metaphor, right? They're up there. Oh my gosh, chaos happened. They had to assemble a bunch of stuff. They landed and you know what? It was only nine months later, NASA was back on the launch pad again. And so I just have to keep telling myself is like, was this a for real promise or was it a fake thing that I thought we needed to do? Because it's a fire in our bellies that says millions of people need to be transformed. Millions really need to be transformed as communicators. And are we willing to make the sacrifice we might need to make to get there in five years? So I would say that was, that was like, ah, you know, we have to do it. Um, but I, I, I've changed as a communicator. Um, I've had to change and I'm, I'm definitely getting more love notes than I've ever gotten as a leader. I, I never used to get love notes when I sent communications out. Um, but I think I've been strong and I think it's because we've been on this rodeo before I have resolved, we prepared for it. Um, but it's not been easy on my team. You know, it's not been easy on anyone. So I don't want to downplay that. No, it, it hasn't. And you know, your your courage and resolve are admirable, and I think a lot of people listening today aspire to that. Um, you know, I, I, um, as we think about employing the techniques and strategies that you were talking about today, and I think this is related to your, to your experience, how do you think about balancing optimism, which is clearly a strong suit of yours, with transparency? Yeah. And are there any particular approaches that you recommend when we really need to share some hard truths, maybe harder truths than we're accustomed to sharing? Yeah. I love that question. I, I, have to, I have to use that model. So all the models I shared today, a lot of them are from my body of work, or I've applied them in a deeper way than I shared today. I need these models for myself, uh, for empathy. So I take a walk for a minute and I just pause and stop and say, what's the emotional fuel? So I had this moment where I was on my, I took a break. I was on my veranda because I like to work on with pen and paper. And I was like, working on the vision, working on what are we going to look like in five years? I was so fired up. Like I had a little bit of sunshine, got a little vitamin D. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I was like, my heart was racing because I was just, at the, I was just like, oh my God, we could do it, we could do it, right? And I knew I was coming right into an employee meeting and I, I could not possibly, I had to do this like physical break, physical breathing, because I knew I couldn't show up to that meeting like fired up. And so I think it's pausing having empathy, there's this moment in storytelling every time where someone puts on the skin of someone else. It's metaphorical. I mean, the most obvious one is Avatar, right? He became blue. He's like, oh, they're my enemy. I'm gonna come blue. Oh my gosh, I like them. In fact, I fell in love with one of them. So the sense of putting on someone's skin or like Jesus became man, like it's even in our religions, like it's like put on the skin of someone else and make change. And so I think that's what leaders need to do. We need to put on the skin of, of of the people we're talking to for a minute, look through their eyes and think about what's the emotional feel. Because you as the leader, you show up, you are reflecting the emotion that you want them to feel at that point in time. I mean, I've I've done well in some parts, I've blown it in some parts, you know, things go well, things spin out. Um, but I think I've uh, I think I've done better than, than uh, you know, I'm, I'm old, I'm older, more mature, but I can't make everyone happy. But I do feel that the way that I've modulated how I show up uh, has been important. In, in the situation of delivering bad news, you need a communication strategy, especially if it's gonna impact lives. We had to do a small layoff and we didn't, we planned it, we did it the way we thought. We got feedback from the company that they didn't like the way it happened. So what we did is we modified, really listened, did a deep listening tour, studied how other companies did it. You have to have a creative uh, communication plan, an FAQ where the management team understands, here's the frequently asked questions that might come out of it, here's why we're doing it. You really have to, especially very sensitive information, you need uh, to possibly even be scripted. It's just, 
it's just um, it's just unprecedented times right now. So um, just have to really hyper prepare for bad news. Thank you. Let's um, let's stay on the um, um, the theme of putting on someone else's skin or walking in someone else's shoes because obviously that's incredibly important. But that is how you have real empathy for somebody. Yeah. I think at the moment in particular. Um, a lot of us don't feel confident we actually understand the other, you know, another person's experience well enough to kind of take that, um, take that presumption, right, um, that I can wear your skin or walk in your shoes. How do you get over that hump? You, there's a leap of faith required here. Yeah, yeah, and it depends on who you're talking to. So there's a lot of in our organization, we use a lot of psychographic tools. So everyone knows, oh, your natural way of communicating is like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to work hard to meet you partway between how we each naturally communicate. So there's ways to do that internally. It is different when it's external or maybe in mass. Like if you're communicating in mass to a lot of people and you need to move a lot of people in the same direction, that's a little bit different. Um, we do listening tours with our customers. We do listening tours internally, and we really, really try to get to what's on their mind. Because if you're not doing listening tours with your customers, you're going to miss some market need. You're going to miss some trend that they're all leaning toward that you'll never know. Um, but you, you really need to ask open-ended question and then just listen. And I'll, I'll call clients and say, look, I want to hear the good, but I want to hear the bad and the ugly. Because it's the bad and the ugly that's going to transform us the most. And it's hard. Like I would record the calls and just flip it. No, no uh, commentary for me. I would just flip it to whoever was managing the account, and they'd be like, "Oh, there's some bad and ugly, right?" Because we want to think that life isn't ugly. I'm doing a great job, and so we just have to share. You're never going to learn if you don't do that. But if you don't give someone permission to be honest and say, "Tell, tell me the ugly. I want to change. I want to be better. Tell me the ugly," you'll never know, and you'll think you're doing fine. So I think anybody who's a leader or a manager, you can create an atmosphere on your team where everyone communicates really, really well. So you should know how to walk in the shoes of the people closest to you. It's the ones that get a little more, um, you know, farther out in your circumference that's a little harder to guess. Um, but, but if you understand and can observe human behavior, uh, you should be able to anticipate what they're going through. For me, when I'm approaching a client, I, I'll set my Google alerts, I'll look at the news, and I'll look at, I'll look, read their 10K, and I'll know, I, I'll try to anticipate everything on their mind. I'll, I'll look at the Twitter feed um, or see what I can find out on social media, just so I kind of know who they are and I can kind of picture, you know, maybe picture what might be on their mind. Um, just so I just take a dip in their life and pull back out. Um, and you're right, it has to take intuition and some assumptions to do that, but that's how I do it. We've got, thank you. We've got a number of questions about, you know, kind of technique and storytelling technique. So let's spend some time um, on some of those. Uh, yeah. one, of our, um, one of our viewers today, um, you know, asks, what is your Genesis story? Like, what, how did you start your company? How do you tell the story of Duarte? Oh, that's a great question because, you know, I, I, uh, I was kind of raised in an economically and emotionally starved environment. So I was like, I guess you go to college when you finish high school. I was pretty bright, graduated with honors, went to one year of college, and I got a C minus in speech communication, a D in English. Now I write books in English about speech communication. And it was like a scarlet letter for me to not have a degree. Like I did what any smart 18-year-old girl does is I got married instead and fortunately married the man of my dreams who is just amazing, but that's kind of a weird start, right? So my man of my dreams fell in love with this thing called a Mac a long time ago. And interestingly, it was like a new art medium for him because he was an artist and he started to do technical illustrations, very pregnant. I was so freaking pregnant, so hormonal. He's trying to start this business. I'm like, look, this is a really dumb idea, dude. Like, it was like that scene in Psycho with the knife and the blood spewing. I would come home from my real job every day and be like, this is terrible. Go get a real job. And I would take the newspaper and 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 put his resume and email, you know, have the stack there ready for him to mail out every day because that's how much I thought this was a dumb idea. And uh, I picked up the phone one afternoon. I, he begged me, read this magazine. I'm like, okay, maybe this is a thing, this thing called a personal computer, but I doubt it. And I picked up the phone and I called Apple Tandem, which is now HP, and NASA. And we won contracts at all three of them. And I never went back to my real job. So I wanted to be a presenter. I wanted to be a communicator my whole life. But that scarlet letter 
was there, like it felt like it was there. And so here's this 28 year old kid. I just become a student of business. I become a student. I was in sales and strategy, but I, I became a, a student of business, read everything HBR put out, read everything I could find, read every book, read every everything Michael Porter did back then, David Ocker, everything. And I would show up to the office of different CEOs in the Silicon Valley and I would be one of the smarter people in the room. And then it was in, um, it was about eight years ago, Cisco uh, petitioned UCLA and asked them to honor all of my work I had done in this business, growing this great business. And they honored that as my undergrad. And then uh, Cisco paid for me to get my MBA from UCLA in a, in a shortened tight pro um, program, which was super cool. So that's kind of the, that's how the story rolls. Great story. Um, here's a question. We're going we're gonna to totally kind of shift over, um, shift, shift in terms of where we are on the topic and sh shift where we are globally uh, to India. Um, in <laughs> India, we use stories from mythology and films, uh, which appeal to broad audiences. What kind of stories do you prefer most? Oh, I love that story. You know, there is a different structure to an Eastern story. Um, usually they're either inconclusive or... Um, you know, more in China and Japan and farther east, they are um, not only inconclusive, but they're cautionary. They're not positive outcome stories. Like if you think about a, a Bollywood movie, even they lean in to kiss and then they never kiss. Like it cuts, oh, it's inconclusive. You know, hopefully the boy got the girl. Um, so they're just a, a, a little bit different um, uh, story structure. And I, I, this is going to sound really weird, but um, so I love um, I love comedy, I love drama. Um, can't watch horror and stuff like that. But my favorite thing to do in the evenings, which you will just die, is I watch freaking Hallmark Channel. It's like oh, you know, you're you're working, you're like oh, they're falling in love, and then you look up, and you're like oh, they had a miscommunication, and you look up because you can I can get email done and feel like I'm not working. Um, so at Hallmark Channel, I guess, is my, my fetish. And then my husband watches them too, which is so cute. And then sometimes he's crying. He's like, and I'm like, dude, go in the other room if you're going to make so much noise, you know, during Hallmark Channel. <laughs> so um, I know that sounds kind of shallow, but that's kind of how I roll. Yeah. Um, yeah, you must, be, you, you must be a fascinating person to watch a movie with. <laughs> break it down. You know, um, when you're listening to a story, you you have involuntary reactions. You laugh, yeah. you cry, you, cry. you, you know, it, it's involuntary. That's how you know it's wired to the brain. And and literally, in during movies, I'm the person that screams. I'm the one that goes ah! <laughs> in the audience that everyone hates. So yeah, that's me too. Um, uh, here's a question about working with temporary teams. I, I work with a lot of temporary teams, projects that last three to six months. Do you have any suggestions on how to um, how to apply what you've been speaking with us about today to temporary teams? Are you know are there different? Do you need? I think we're going. Do you need relations? Do you need deep relationships for the power of story to be effective, or can you work? You know, can can you come in with someone never you've never worked with before and be as effective? I I well I don't know if it's just because of my our culture at our company, but when a new team starts or forms, a lot of times one of the first meetings they'll do is everyone will tell a story, and and that's just how we roll, and so. I've been pretty astounded how someone even knew or somebody who's not in the firm, once they see how do, how we roll with the story and how honest we become, you understand so much about where someone's come from, why they show up the way they do, even with just a peek into their heart. And uh, that's a, a great, you know, you, you have to do kind of some way to get everyone to know each other and, and having them tell a story is a great way to start. And it forms a bond. It actually bonds the hearts to each other. And that bond sometimes might be the very fuel you need to last that full six months. So we, we have story nights here. We have a thing called Speak Up, where we have eight people tell eight minute stories. So story is just constant um, in our culture. But I, I, I'm not saying that just because that, but I, I sincerely believe that a, a new team can bond very quickly if everyone tells a story right at the beginning. Could you talk a little bit about um, the, the, the difference, if you, as you see it, between what you do to kind of kickstart someone's intrinsic or internal motivation versus being being the external motivator is that or is that even a fair distinction yeah i think i think there is a way to find 
what resonates in someone uh, for meaning, right? So, and values, if you get to a place of shared values and shared meaning, you can resonate really deeply. So if you think about the concept of resonance itself, when, when something resonates at the deepest level, the other thing will vibrate at the same frequency. So if this is vibrating at one frequency and you hit the resonant frequency of something else, it too will vibrate at the same um, frequency. That concept is true, you know, in life, in love, in relationships, is that once you really know um, that person, you can, you can kind of hit the resonant frequency. So my husband and I are polar opposites and I'm very opposite a lot of the people at the company. Some people have the exact same uh, temperament that I do, but we don't, we have different values. So they express themselves very different. I think the more you manage a team, I think within six months of being a manager of someone, you really should know what motivates them, what drives them, maybe the same or different than you, but you need to know that. And then you can tell stories in a way that motivates them. So it is the responsibility, I think, of the leader to give permission by letting them get to know you first. Um, and then they'll let, they'll let you get to know them. Thank you. Let, let's talk a little bit um, more about kind of the context of leadership and who. Um, well, I'm gonna I, I'm I'm gonna pull back and ask you a specific question. I think I'll get lost um, otherwise. One of the questions that we frequently hear in our programs when someone is is inspired is how do I get upper management to kind of buy into this, right? And so that kind of begs the question. You know, we framed we framed story right, as a leadership tool, but it's not exclusively a leadership tool, right? It's a technique that anyone in an organization um, can deploy. So maybe we could do a little thought experiment. How do we use stories to actually, um, to, to actually engage with senior management so they can see the power of story? That's a very meta question, I know. Yeah, you know, we work, yeah, it, it, it's awesome because we get to work with the most powerful executives in the world, like in the top five fortune 500 we work with top execs up there and so um they've adopted story like if you look at how they communicate they have adopted story um we worked with one who had a habit of being like oh my gosh at my last company you know he see you know, i did this i did that i'm awesome and at my last company i also accomplished this and that and you know self-congratulatory and it was like the uh, his feedback came back saying people are kind of tired of hearing about your wins and we want you to bring it back here to this culture because you work here now and we worked with him and got him to do a really nuanced change uh to his talk and it wasn't about talking about a win it's like is there anywhere in this company where you tried and failed and then and then tried again because that's where we're at we want people to take risks and all that so he told stories like oh yeah there was this little skunk works project um and i was like oh i want to make a big bet there and i was wrong like it was a pretty simple story the masses came out and were like that's your best talk ever i mean not that much else changed but actually utilizing a story and um story is really important in dni right now we're working with a lot of executives to curate and cultivate what are the stories that are in the culture and listen to them right now people need to be really listening to their stories and be curators of their own stories so to get executives to buy in, some of it's having to show them data, some of it's having to explain the science of what's going on in the brain when a story is being told. Um, all those are tools that we use ourselves when we're trying to get executives to understand the power. Problem is, there's not a lot of execs that'll stand up and be like, hey, uh, life is hard, I'm changed, right? That's like the basic criteria of the story. Hey, <laughs> I, I was tried and then I had all these roadblocks and I overcame the roadblocks. Just the nature of a story, not that many people will want to adopt because especially if it's a political culture, they won't want to adopt it. Um, and so it, 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 once they do though, um, the transparency, the authenticity and all those things, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of cred and um, people want to follow you. I'll follow a leader who's tried and fails and talks about it before I'll follow a leader that pretends life's not hard because life's hard and we're not perfect. And I mean, you heard me say, even in my talk, I'm like, God, I'm kind of talking about how I made some mistakes. And that's not very, that doesn't make me look great, but you know what? I'm not perfect. And I'm not going to stand in front of anyone and say I am, but I try. I do, I do right by my team most of the time, uh, but there's times I've hurt people and, um, and I'm okay with that. I have to be, because I'll never be able to show up perfect. So without 
without getting political, I think I think there's there's definitely some interest um, from our audience in talking about the power of story as a way to understand the social climate we're in. Um, so I, I, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, on on the power of story as demonstrated by the awful right incidents with George Floyd, with Breonna Taylor being the two most recent of a of, of a long list. Yeah. And how those awful stories have inspired social justice activity in a way that feels rather it feels unprecedented, yeah. right? That somehow these stories. Um, captured a power and a resonance that yeah. previous stories, every bit as awful and horrendous, did not. And then also, so we're seeing a power of story there, right? A horrifying story, but a power. And, and then there, I think there's a flip that we're also seeing how story can create divide yeah. when people don't have a common context and they're yeah. hearing very different versions, perhaps of the same, very different stories based on the same same situation. So. I'm not sure what the question is, but I'd love to hear you just kind of reflect. I love this, this non-question question because, you know, I think um, as far as the divide goes, I think it's sometimes one of the worst things that happened to our culture. I, a friend of mine told me this recently. It's kind of that share and the like button that hit us about eight years ago, right? Because it's like we we now can just follow somebody who and start to shape perceptions, but it creates divide. And this guy said. Um, that shared it with me is that he thinks we'll be in a culture of dissent for about a thousand years, possibly. And I was like, whoa, I don't even think in millennials, millenniums. But I was like, I actually could picture that it's going to take us a long time for the world or even America to have one shared narrative. Now, your question, particularly um, about George Floyd, I love, love this question. And I think one of my uh, Black employees answered it for me. The thing that sparked a difference with George Floyd than any of the others is we heard his spoken words. Now you think about the power of the spoken word, you can't think of a movement that didn't start with an impassioned plea that came out of someone's mouth. We heard his dying words as he transitioned into the afterlife crying for his mom. That, that George Floyd in a way is a classic um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. It's a death, a burial. And because of the criminality or the crisis his burial was, the resurrection is justice and that's what we're doing we're fighting now to take this messy middle and have a happy ending but i think the power and it and, it, and it's and it's giving a voice to the briannas and the other um the other voices that weren't heard because because we could hear his impassioned plea and we've never gotten that view before and that i think is the power of the spoken where the power of story is we caught him right in the middle of his messy middle and now we're going to fight hard uh, for justice for him. Um, it's a powerful season right now and everyone needs to be really listening. We built our own internal team. I'm letting the employees run um, and shape what our um, promise. We didn't make a statement. I want my firm to make a promise. I want it to be something all my people can sign and we're going to make a promise of what we're going to do about it. Because so I think there's a difference between a statement and something every employee in an organization can rally behind. And um, it's a really powerful, really powerful season right now. And it, it might take us a long time. And I really am glad that um, people are going to have the energy to just sustain the movement. I don't love how some people are uh, coming out and showing up. I don't think it's that different than how the president shows up or whatever. I think there's um, there's a lot of sorrow and sadness in how how it's happening, but I think it's going to happen, uh, which will be nice to see equality and justice for all. Finally, it would be nice. Thank you. That is such a great Nancy Duarte answer to that question. <laughs> oh, um, can, can you? Here's a. Uh, we've got. I'm gonna. I'm gonna kind of move through. We have so many questions. So many great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, some of our viewers would like to hear you address gender bias, um, kind of when men versus women use empathy and display empathy. Um, one of our viewers um, makes this statement, empathy coming from women is usually well received as opposed to men leaders who may be seen as being too soft. Huh. I'm not an expert in that. And I haven't studied communication based on gender lines before. Um, I would have thought uh, women do tend to be by nature a bit more communal and and I, I don't know I, I don't think I'm an expert in that whatsoever so I'm gonna have to take a pass on that um, we support a lot of um, 
speakers, I think one of my speaker coaches might be able to answer that better because they would see patterns more readily and how they see um, how they see people show up. Um, beyond um, the resources that you provide, and you've very, very generously I think, shared a number um, of links um, as well as your presentation today, um, what other resources would you suggest to help cultivate storytelling skills? Like, who do you turn to? Yeah, you know what I think is a really great storytelling podcast for business people is Masters of Scale. Um, I think. Um, I think they've done a good job. Anything that uh, the production company, Wait What, it's called Wait What, um, anything they produce is uh, really, really good content. I had to take my own journey, you know, through a lot of the anti-racism material, and so I did that. Um, but I'm going back to some classics now, right now, and I I'm having to go back to, like, Built to Last and some of the classics in this season. Um, but I try to stay inspired. Um, believe it or not, uh, my husband keeps me grounded too he'll play the guitar for me sometimes at night and um, it's kind of nice right because he he um, really supports me and gives me a lot of emotional fuel so I'm devouring anything um, a girlfriend of mine has a new book coming out that's going to be amazing she was the black first black CEO in the Silicon Valley and her book's coming out called an unapologetically ambitious so I do a lot of pre-reads um, uh, for people and that's going to be fantastic world-changing book very inspiring about her life um, so I, I try to read enough kind of memoir, enough self-help, and then enough Hallmark Channel <laughs> to keep me going. I'm taking you as a Hallmark Channel person. I know, I know. I, I, love yes. I wish I could see your face when I said it, but that's, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, uh, here's another question. Uh, should you take different approaches to the times when you're trying to draw people into conversations versus simply trying to inspire them to action? So different storytelling techniques in those cases? I think, I think unless it's a big staged event where you're talking to a broad audience, I think most of our communications are conversations or a, a meeting or um, a sales call. And preparing for an empathetic conversation is as much work as preparing for a, a TED talk if it's super high, high, um, super high stakes. And so there are ways to plan through a conversation using empathy. A lot of the models in my books work for conversations. But if you think it's going to be hostile or it's going to, they're, they're going to come kind of at you or be a lot of resistance, you have to have, um, you have to anticipate every way they might resist. Um, I just had to work on something like this. And I had someone rehearse two and a half hours, two and a half hours, just interrupting me, acting bad. Like I, I really wanted to nail it and I wanted to stay calm. And so you brainstorm all the ways this person might be upset or how they might be excited or just be ready and, and, and rehearse it in your head if you have to show up with a certain level of emotional energy. Um, planning, but you can't be robot. I can't be like, and so now let's transition the conversation to, <laughs> it, it takes practice. Um, to be able to, you know, show up and be your genuine self when you're having to drive a conversation. I think inspiring every time is important. Depending on where they're at emotionally, inspiration could simply be acknowledging how they feel and they mm -hmm. feel inspired by you. Or it could be like, oh, wow, you made me brave. You know, I'm, I'm going to go run out in the street and scream. I'm so happy. It, it, and you can be that kind of um, inspiring too. So you you need to understand um, which <laughs> how to show up. And when I would deliver talks, especially with resonate, it, I took the spoken word and made it almost it is almost mathematical, right? Because I an analyzed it, and I would finish a talk, and people would be like, look, this the whole time. And then I you have to keep your energy up. You're trying to kill it, right? And then I finish, and you get a standing ovation because they were they were like. Ch -ch 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 like they were clicking, they were getting it, they were like studying it, and then they were then they were changed. And so you can't always read, um, you can't always read the body signs that you're getting um, all the way to, right? So people are such a mystery, Paul, right? And I only have it partially figured out, but um, that's a really good question. It's so interesting you use the example of an in-person event um, to, you know, to, to demonstrate the challenge of the game to read people, and they are a mystery. I would mm -hmm. say, you know, personally, I find um, doing what I'm doing today, moderating a conversation in front of a live audience, often much easier 
because you can at, the, at least you have the chance to read a room right you can you can see if people are in a good mood generally are they you know are they laughing are they responding and you you kind of you know weave 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 a conversation based on that um, now this particular um, platform we're using doesn't even allow us to see the audience yeah. um, but when you're when, when you're in the context of leading a team, I am interested in talking a little bit about how to overcome some of the kind of emotional coldness of the electronic divide. Yeah. Um, how do you, I mean, do you spend a lot of time looking at looking at your teams, you know, at people's faces on Zoom? I mean, what, what are some of the things that, um, that, you know, some of the techniques you're using to try to read how people are feeling on a flat screen? Yeah, that's a really good question because, um, they what they need from me is different than what I need from them. Um, mm -hmm. And so what they need from me is eye contact, sincerity. They need to see my facial expressions. And if I'm looking at everyone's face and I'm checking to make sure everyone's OK, they won't receive me the same way. So I try to make sure I, I, I do a read, but I, I glance and process and then I go straight back to looking at the camera. So this whole time I have been looking at a little green glowing dot at the top of my Mac, right? <laughs> and that's what I've looked at this whole time. And I, I, it took me, um, because I present a lot in webinars, it took a while for me to have my heart warm when I see that little dot. I, at first I stuck like smiley, I did like a monitor crown and I put smiley faces of my employees. They'd be smiling and cheering me on. And then like I had to kind of get to where I actually get a physical reaction now when I look at the little dot, knowing that there's humans on the other side of it, and that's not easy. And it takes extra energy, to your point, to really communicate well and clear. You're more sapped in an hour than you would be in an hour-long meeting because of this medium. And so even when we did our exec planning, uh, we were in, in Zoom meetings four hours every afternoon for a week, and we talked about what? And, and we decided, you know what, when there's going to be a lot of dialogue, let's let's construct our agenda where we're just not even at our computers. Everyone's going to go on a walk. We're all going to be on a walk together. We're all going to dial in. And we're just going to have a conversation and, and break through and do decision making while we're on the walk because it's just hard and you get fatigue. And so you have to pace yourself. Um, but the, the big moments that are the most critical, um, like I said, I started dropping um, video memos and mm -hmm. that way they could hear my tone and they were full of content. Like if you didn't hear the memo, you missed something very important. And I think that was just a really important way to address uh, some of that remote because they could do it on their own. A lot of them showed their family. They're like, this is who I work for. And, and they're like, oh my God, that's a great that was amazing. Now I know what's going on in your in your company or whatever. So, um, yeah, I just think it's important. It's important for us to understand the medium. And um, we have coaches like right now. We're coaching all the execs because all these big conferences are flipping virtual, and most of them don't know how to kind of work a camera or whatever. So there's two extremes. So there's the okay, like we are ship we ship like let's say you need to ship a green screen because it's a high, high, high production event. Yes, we want the exec in a suit and a tie and we want them in front of the green screen. But when it's when it's uh, internal, I wanna see that exec have their kids crawling on them and I want the dog to bark and I want their, their wife or husband to be like, honey, or whatever, because you have to show that you're on an even playing field with everyone, that you're no better than, different than, than they are, but you're in it with them. So there's kind of different modalities on working virtual and the needs, the skills you need are different. And I'm telling you, communication is the number one skill that's missing. It's the number one skill gap and has been now for two years. So working on that, especially remotely and really nailing it is super smart to do right now. You'll get ahead. <laughs> you can get ahead. Does every message need a story? And I think the answer, I, I'm gonna presume, well, actually, no, I'm not gonna presume anything. I'm gonna leave the question just there. I, uh, story, I think, is a bit of a nested narrative. There's, in a movie, say there's three acts, every act has a scene and every scene has an emotional beat. Something like a tweet is maybe a beat in a bigger narrative. So if you're looking at brand narrative, there's a whole lot of things you can do that manage that narrative. If you're sitting uh, at a cocktail party, stories naturally happen. You know, you're relaxed, you're bonding, and it's a more a, a situation where humans are flourishing. I don't tell a story every time I communicate, not every single time. Um, there's formats. I, I use contrast, the gap between what is, could be, what is, what could be, what is, what could be, because the brain can process format uh, contrast 
It's just as wired for that from our fight or flight instinct. So I'll either tell a story or I move back and forth between what is, what could be, what is, what could be, what is, what could be, until we both see a shared reality. Um, so there's other kind of communication devices that can get you to the same place, but story is um, by far the one that will attach your hearts to each other. Oh, that's a great way to punctuate this conversation. Nancy, thank you so much. Thanks um, for having me. For our audience, thank you, thank you, thank you for the overwhelming number of questions. And as always, um, we only got to a small portion of them. Um, over the next few days, uh, please look out for a survey that'll come via email and we greatly, greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, that concludes our program. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to our sponsor, Skillsoft. We hope you will join us for our next program. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.